Okay, we're back. We're live. Okay, we're back. We're live uh, here on Think Tech on Global Connections uh, with Michael Davis, who is an expert in Hong Kong, taught at uh, what Hong Kong University for many years, and is very familiar with the dynamic of that city. In fact, he consults and writes about it even today. Uh, he's uh, what stationed in Washington, living in New York. Did I get that right, Michael? Yeah. And uh, so today we're going to talk about Hong Kong. We're going to talk about what's happened since it was all all over the front page. You know, banner headlines every day. It seems to have gotten quiet. Has it really gotten quiet, Michael? No, it hasn't. And and the situation hasn't really been resolved. Uh, I just came back. I, I'm doing a report on Hong Kong uh, for the National Democratic Institute. And I spent two weeks in uh, December interviewing uh, people across the spectrum in Hong Kong to, to come up with the, the report. And, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting to talk to them because, quite frankly, they seem more optimistic than the rest of us are. So that that's kind of encouraging, or, I, or do, I'm not quite sure to, rather to be encouraged by it. Maybe they're they're not being realistic. Who knows? But at the end of the day, they're determined. That's clearly the case. Well, the determination may be uh, maybe weakening, don't you think? Uh, they they put a lot, they spilled a lot of blood, if you will. Uh, they spent a lot of time in the streets. They haven't, you know, been able to attend their jobs or their school for quite some time. Um, and I imagine the protesters have gotten tired. And as they have gotten tired, so has the press gotten tired. And as the press fades on it, so so does world of, world opinion, don't you think? Well, there's certainly a, a, a you know at this moment a, a less attention to it because a number of other problems have arisen in the world in in Iran and and uh, other places. So th there's always a competition for global attention. Yes. But I, I think Hong Kong has captured a lot of people's imagination. I've been to events even. Here locally, I attended an event yesterday where uh, just local people in Connecticut were all very much on top of what's going on in Hong Kong. So, I, and, and I did find when I talked to people there that most of them, the, the people on the what we call the pan-democratic side, uh, were very interested in having international support because they see that as very critical to maybe nudging Beijing in the right direction and 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 that's no no small order to do that uh, beijing of course gets its back up and doesn't really uh, like to give in to popular protests but it is striking that they also haven't sent in the army or anything uh, they they've certainly used the tools they have in hong kong to repress people but uh, and we see the reports of police abuse all the time uh, but at the same time uh, there's, you know, some caution. And, and I would add a footnote here that there was an election in Taiwan over, over the, the past couple of days. Uh, and that result went against Beijing. So it kind of sent a, a further message. So so we had an election in November in Hong Kong where the pan-democrats uh, won a stunning victory. Uh, and then election in Taiwan where a politician who had not been a year ago that, that popular mm -hmm. uh, pulled off a big election. So I think there's a message to Beijing in all of this. We just don't know whether they'll receive the message. Well, you know, there uh, certainly that um, the re-election of uh, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, is it, in Taiwan? Yes. That's a, that's a, yeah. that's a startling ex, um, expression of how the Taiwanese, Taiwanese, Taiwanese feel about um, the reunification of China uh, under what? One country, one country, <laughs> instead of one country yeah. through systems. Uh, the same that's issue, right. really, isn't it? The, the same issue in Hong Kong, maybe in slightly different oblique, but the same issue in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. You know, come under the mothership, be part of China. We're going to foist our entire system on you. Or, you know, if you, if we can, or rather, if we're willing, we'll, we'll give you some autonomy. That autonomy is uh, is not what Xi Jinping wants. He wants to take it all. He wants China to rule both Taiwan and Hong Kong. And uh, you know what? If he waits his turn, if he waits until what? 2047, in the case of Hong Kong, he'll have what he wants, won't he? Ultimately, he'll have what he wants. 
Well, it, you know, the thing about it is, is the price of, of getting what he wants may be very high. And I think this is why there's a little, uh, perhaps a slightly higher level of optimism among activists in Hong Kong uh, than there is uh, among the global observers. Uh, and that they realize that so much of China's wealth passes through Hong Kong. People like to make the point that Hong Kong used to be a, you know, a quarter of China's economy in size, and now it's 3%. But trust me, the 3% that Hong Kong is right now is the critical 3%. Uh, two thirds of China's international investments pass through Hong Kong because people want to have a reliable legal system uh, to, to carry on their investments. Uh, two thirds of the companies uh, listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange are mainland companies or affiliated with mainland companies. So uh, not only is the world going into China through Hong Kong, but China is going out to the world through Hong Kong. And so this is the problem for, for the rulers in Beijing, that so much uh, wealth is there. And, and of course, Chinese wealth, sometimes uh, politicians in China have their own personal wealth. So on one level, uh, China, uh, you know, one of the reasons this thing got started was an extradition bill that was going to allow them to get people sent back and be arrested. But one of the reasons they wanted that was to reach corrupt money that had found its home in Hong Kong. But at the same time, I mean, a lot of Chinese leaders, uh, you know, care about the money their family members have in Hong Kong. So it, it's, a, it's a dilemma for them. Well, that bill is over, isn't it? That was finally and fully withdrawn, wasn't it? It was indeed. And, and that, that's an example of, of, you know, the protest in Hong Kong don't always fail. Uh, I, I myself was involved in the Article 23 Concern Group. I think we talked about this more than a decade ago, probably, uh, on, on Think Tech. That you know we pushed through, pushed hard against the government's attempt to enact all these national security laws and everything, secrecy laws and stuff, basically authoritarian kinds of things. Uh, and one in that case too, that, that, that the bill was withdrawn exactly like this extradition bill. So, you know, flash forward 15 years uh, and uh, 16 years, I guess it is. And there you, again, there's a case where, where public protest paid off. Now it's never paid off when it comes to democratic reform. Uh, when we did that in 2004, we, we changed our, after winning on the article 23, we took up democratic reform and got nowhere, uh, again, had a, you know, half a million protesters on the street. So that didn't work. And then in 2014, much more recently, when we had the so-called umbrella movement in yes. Hong Kong, which I know you and I talked about, yes, we talked about uh, that. again, pushing for democratic reform doesn't work. So the message seems to be when Beijing's calling the shots, which they do when it comes to democratic reform, uh, the protests have not been as successful. Now, of course, the current protest raises the question I know you're going to ask, and that's the question of violence and so on. Does violence pay? And there's a kind of feeling, and I talk to people in Hong Kong about this, that, you know, well, violence might have paid because first there was a million protesters in early June on the streets and the bill wasn't withdrawn. Then there was two million protesters the next week on June the 16th, and the, the uh, bill was not withdrawn. But when people broke into the Legislative Council and broke a few chairs and made a big scene uh, vandalizing the Legislative Council, uh, soon after that, the bill was first suspended. And well, that wasn't enough, some more aggressive behavior on the street. So one of the, the signs that was pasted on the wall of the Legislative Council is that you guys taught us that, that uh, nonviolence doesn't pay that we, we need to use violence in order to get what we want. So, so well, this is a violence dilemma. on either side, too. I remember seeing some oh, yeah. footage of, um, of oh, the Hong yeah. Kong police uh, shooting somebody point blank range. Um, didn't kill him, but uh, it was all on uh, a, a cell phone and it, got, it went right. viral around the world. And that kind of violence right. gets people's attention and that leads to change, don't you think? Either side. Whoever is violent. And of course, this is why one of the surprising things of this particular movement that's going on right now is the level of public support 
that has been sustained uh, through this. In these earlier protests, you could count on public support for a, a while, but after a while, people got protest fatigue and it would end. But in this case, the, the level of public support was has, has been sustained all the way up to the present. Uh, and, and one of the big reasons for that has been the level of police violence. Uh, and so the police have been using it, not just that incident you talked about, but there are occasions where they were trying to clear areas near shopping malls and shoving people down escalators. Uh, there's so many cases. I interviewed a lot of the, the leading lawyers that are uh, doing uh, organizing volunteer defense work for now 7,000 people that have been arrested. And one of the things that one of the leading lawyers, and there's three major groups that have hotlines to provide legal defense work. One of the things he pointed out is 70, 80 percent of the people, they, uh, their clients that they come to see have uh, physical uh, injuries. So the police have been, uh, you know, at least allegedly, it seems that there's a lot of brutality. Now, these things can occur in two ways. One is during arrest and one is after arrest. Ah, sure. Uh, and so that this has been, a, uh, I think, a major factor in keeping public support high. There's a sense, I think, in Hong Kong, and people use this term, they say this is the last stand, that if we don't push back against this uh, constantly increasing Beijing interference in Hong Kong, then the Hong Kong we know is gone. Are they right? I'm probably right. This yeah. is unfortunately the case. I, I mean, the work I've been doing over the many years in this on this particular uh, area of Hong Kong has has shown me that what goes on over time is more and more Beijing control, more and more Beijing interference, which is very much contrary to the, the promises that were made in the Sino-British Treaty of 1984 and then the subsequent uh, basic law that was enacted under it, which presented a kind of liberal open society. I think what we have is a problem with a communist hardline regime really not knowing what's the critical ingredients of an open society. And Hong Kong has been one of the most open societies in the world. Freedom Forum for years ranked Hong Kong's economy as the freest in the world. So uh, this is uh, been a great what, what uh, weekend for, for all of Asia. But uh, you know what oh, yeah. I don't understand? Maybe you can help me with this. The Hong Kong police, they're Hong Kong, Hong Kongese. They're the neighbors and friends of the people that they're beating up. Um, how is that possible? It just seems wrong and, and un, not intuitive somehow to have a Hong yeah. Kong policeman beating up on his neighbor and friend. They're all in the same pot, aren't they? Yeah, well, this is the thing that, that has perplexed a lot of people, and there's been a lot of questions about it. Uh, there are some, uh, there are a number of things that people come up with to explain it. One is that the police have been very much aligned, and, and over the recent years, a lot of interaction has occurred between the Public Security Bureau on the mainland and the Hong Kong police. So a lot of the leadership of the police uh, you know, who get appointments and so on, uh, I think feel uh, a close relationship with the mainland Public Security Bureau. So, so the sensitivity level at the top has not been high uh, among the police. There's also been allegations that there is some infiltration of the police by mainlanders being hired into the police department. Uh, uh. And because the people on the street, and of course, rumors get going on the street really fast all the time. But one of the things that one hears is that people c complain that some of the police officers <laughs> there are speaking Mandarin, uh, and which means that they're not of local from, origin. From PRC. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a number, yeah, there's a number of these things that have uh, come up that uh, people, uh, you know, become part of the rumor mill. Uh, and then there are some things that are widely have been widely reported. For example, Hong Kong police have received terrorism training in uh, of all places in Xinjiang, which is where the Uyghur problem is at, uh, and where the mainland po policies have been extremely heavy-handed. You know, with a million people reportedly in camps and so on. 
uh, this has been the attention of being the attention of the United Nations and so on. So there, there's there are some efforts to explain uh, this, and then some of it I think is just you know the police are so severely under attack that there's a kind of defensiveness that emerges. Uh, I think in, in in the police. Well, I can I can imagine the average Hong Kongese is that the right term, uh, being concerned about what happens uh, in was it Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs are. Um, I, Xinjiang, I imagine yeah. Xinjiang, Xinjiang, yeah, Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs yeah. are, because because that's you know openly oppressive. It's um, it's really cruel. It involves um, yeah. you know euphemisms like retraining when it's really torture, um, and yeah. it's it's something that that. China has become synonymous with because of the Uyghur issue. Um, so if, yeah. if you say, well, the, ultimately um, the PRC will take over Hong Kong, pretty scary business that if you offend China, if you're going upstream on their policies, uh, you could be treated like a Uyghur. I would be concerned about that and it would motivate me to do more protests, to hold the line on not letting China take over Hong Kong and undermine my democracy. Well, see, this is the, the thing, yeah, and of course the democracy is only a half-baked one at the moment, uh, half of the legislative council. Uh, nearly all of the district council was directly elected, so that they, the Democrats, the activists in Hong Kong, turned that into a, the, the November election there into a kind of referendum on the protest, and of course they, they won that. Um, I, but I think you're also highlighting something that uh, explains maybe why Hong Kong is so uh, near and dear to the hearts of people around the world is that we're in the age now where a kind of uh, pushback against democratic reform around the world has occurred. Authoritarian regimes have emerged and so on. And in many ways, Hong Kong is viewed as sort of the, you know, the, the, the bad in, in, the, in the, whatever it is that the bats are doing, the test, the, the air. The stream, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah kind of on the leading edge of all of, of this uh, global debate over de democracy and human rights. And interestingly enough, just this week, the head of Human Rights Watch was turned away from Hong Kong. He came in, uh, he's been to Hong Kong many times before, uh, Mr. Roth, and he flew into Hong Kong and was taken back through security and put on a plane <laughs> out of Hong Kong. Uh, now, Human Rights thing. Watch... Like, <laughs> yeah, Human Rights Watch actually has an office in Hong Kong, but he was taken away. When I went there, I was part of a, I, I led a research team that was uh, included Georgetown University and the National Democratic Institute. The National Democratic Institute is, is kind of a, a part of a three uh, triumvirate, if you will, of U.S. promoted democracy organizations at the top being the National Endowment for Democracy, and then there's the National Democratic Institute and so on. As, as because I was, the, they were sponsoring uh, in part the, this uh, report we're doing, I found myself that I had the entire front page of the leading Communist Party newspaper in Hong Kong, which is called the Dagong Bao. So uh, I, in fact, there was nothing else on the front page except uh, our, our visit. I, I suppose so, congratulations are in order. Yeah, that's right. So it was interesting that they were saying that we were having secret meetings with democracy leaders, except our secret meeting was in the restaurant of the Mandarin Hotel. I don't know how it can be secret in the leading hotel in Hong Kong. But, so what about but, Carrie uh, Lam? And, uh, what about Carrie Lam? She's still there, and she's—I uh, yeah. think we all agree—she's an agent of Beijing here. Uh, but then uh, something else happened within the last week or so, maybe two weeks, where Beijing appointed some substitute official to come down from China um, and replace yes. someone else uh, and and tighten the noose essentially, tighten the control. Uh, are you familiar with that? Can you talk about that? Absolutely. In fact, tomorrow, if you read the Nikkei Asian Review, you'll see my op-ed on, on that particular appointment. So this is really interesting because this official is a, a very senior one in China's Communist Party. So he, he is going to head the liaison office in Hong Kong. Now, some people, in a very snarky way, refer to the liaison office as the second government in Hong Kong. <laughs> Now it's supposed to be 
a, a as the term liaison suggests, just a, a kind of, it, it is not provided for in any basic law or joint declaration. It's just an office the Chinese government uh, created in Hong Kong so that they could have someone uh, staff there monitoring developments in Hong Kong and communicating back to Beijing what's going on. And the basic law, in fact, expressly provides that no office of the central government other than the central government itself uh, is allowed to interfere in Hong Kong in any way. But how, however that may be, this liaison office is there. It was created actually before the handover. Uh, China was represented in Hong Kong by something called the New China News Agency or Xinhua. And Xinhua is the global uh, news network of the Chinese government. It still exists, it's all over the world. And uh, that they, in effect, functioned as a Beijing embassy, if you will, when British rule was going on. So the liaison office is the replacement for Xinhua in that role. And they're supposed to stay out of Hong Kong's business, but they're always in Hong Kong's business. And the guy that was in charge of it before, a fellow named Wang Jinmin, uh, got into a lot of trouble because somehow he was telling Beijing that they were going to win that election to the district council. Bad call. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, so what happens, and, and this is where Kerry Lam gets involved and the Hong Kong government gets involved as well, and, and all these pro-Beijing uh, Hong Kongers, uh, uh, all sort of tainted by this, that they always report to Beijing what Beijing wants to hear. Of course, this, as you know, probably already is the kind of disease of the mainland government system that officials all over the country yeah. report what, what people want to hear. That's why, you know, they, they had the great leap forward way back, you know, decades ago, and which was a total disaster in which 40 some million people died unnatural deaths because uh, they were burning up, uh, you know, melting down their farm implements and everything else to create steel. So this, and, and the SARS epidemic was another symptom of this reporting, uh, not, not reporting in that case, what was going on. So this is a problem and it intruded on Hong Kong. So they send down this big guy. He's more, he's supposedly under the Hong Kong and Macau affairs office in Beijing, except he's more senior than the top guy. In, in the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. So he's obviously a fixer. He's a guy in there just coming. Recently, the Communist Party's fourth plenum issued a statement that Hong Kong, uh, they needed to improve Hong Kong security and they needed to re-educate the youth in Hong Kong and re-educate officials in Hong Kong and all of this. So we imagine this guy's being sent down there, sent down to Hong Kong to do all of this. Uh, which is exactly why they always get into trouble. <laughs> These kinds of efforts. If you do this in a totally controlled society like North Korea, you'll get away with it because anybody who gets in your way will go to jail. But if you do this in an open society, what do you get? You get pushback. Yeah. And this is the problem with the, the whole policy on Hong Kong. Well, and we're not seeing improvement yet. You know, you know what I worry about in the larger sense, and I hope that you and I can have many conversations going forward about this. I think we will. And that is, uh, you know, there's, this is relentless push by Xi Jinping and Beijing and the Politburo to unify China and grab all these properties and territories back within unified control. And uh, although, you know, there's a sine curve of up and down here in Hong Kong, uh, relentlessly, mm -hmm. they're going to put officials like this guy in, and they're going to tighten the control as much as they can. They're going to avoid bringing the tanks in, but everything else they'll bring in, and they'll. And then the generations will change. These kids, these students, the people in the streets, um, they'll be a different generation in five years. They may behave differently. Who knows? At the same time, well, you know, you have you have yeah. Taiwan, and so China is determined to rope these places in. And in a decade or two or three, don't you think, Michael, that there's really no alternative, but that China will relentlessly do just that? Well, I think that's that's their goal. And Xi Jinping, I think more than any of the previous leaders, uh, is more determined to make this happen uh, sooner rather than later, uh, especially the Taiwan thing, which is a very sore spot uh, in the Communist Party uh, view of the world. Uh, 
but you know, I, I suppose people on the other side, if they have uh, some level of optimism, they there's a view that this kind of governance is is you know against the trend of history, uh, this kind of hardline behavior, and and that's why what's going on in Hong Kong is of such global interest because this you know is history going to push us back in the direction of uh, you know, monarchs or, you know, if not monarchs, you know, dictators, uh, are we, where, what is the trend? Where are we headed in the world? Yeah. And it, in this sense that Hong Kong's in the leading edge. And then the question becomes, uh, is what China's doing and the way it's doing it sustainable? Uh, one would think so given the wealth that they've accumulated and the, they, they seem to, as observed by the rest of us, the China seems so successful, uh, bringing you know hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions, out of poverty and so on. But you, if you deconstruct that and look at it more carefully, uh, you'll find there's problems with it. One is it wasn't really Beijing's communism that brought them out of poverty; it was the rest of the world, in, you know, inducing them to have a, a free market economy. Um, that that achieved that purpose and, so, so and the Beijing and the Beijing instinct in fact in recent years has been to try to increase state control and in some ways to undermine the free market economy and we've seen the level of economic growth decline un under that policy yeah. so that's one side of the story the other side of the story is well maybe everybody else thinks Beijing is doing so well but obviously Xi Jinping doesn't think so he's very insecure He's very, He's, you know, all of these efforts to control and contain are not uh, a sign of success, but a sign of worry that, that you know, it's that the situation is such that uh, the party could be pushed aside. Uh, I, and I, so, uh, um, and I want yeah. to continue this conversation. Uh, the next time we speak, I would like to discuss what the United States is doing, uh, what it can do and the effect of its actions on all of these processes we've been talking about. Very important questions. Thank you so much, Michael Davis, a Hong Kong expert, um, an author, um, think tank person uh, who watches it so carefully. <laughs> you watch it, we watch you. Thank you so much, Michael. Talk again soon. You're welcome. Aloha. Yeah. Bye -bye.